Chapter 6 All Aboard Two days later the joyless eyes of Jack Montaigne looked down from the side of a foothill upon a streak of black, hurrying across the valley, with a trailing cloud of white drawn out above it. Montaigne drew a great breath of relief. He looked back instinctively toward the mountains, rolling huge and sullen above him, as if he expected them to put forth an arm and catch him back. After all the perils, he had escaped and come to easy striking distance of the railroad, and the railroad meant freedom. In a few days it could carry him away to the ends of the country, where the names of Zeller and Benton were never dreamed of. He visualized himself in a far-off city, reading an obscure notice in an obscure paper about the futile hunt for Jack Montaigne, yeah. wanted for murder. For by this time, they had surely hunted back to the town of his origin, and there they had learned that other and shameful story, and his name with it. He bowed his head at the thought of it. Then he shrugged back his shoulders and started his pony down the mountainside and toward the rambling collection of houses in the distance. Two miles from the outskirts he came to a pleasant meadow, where a brook tumbled brightly in the sunshine. Here he dismounted, took off the saddle and bridle, and waved the horse away to freedom. The invitation was accepted with a snort and a flirt of the heels. For a moment, Montaigne watched with a sigh, and then turned back to take up his trail. He so timed his approach that he reached the vicinity of the town at dusk and then skirted about it to the railroad. Of course, it would not do to linger near the station, but that would not be necessary. Hardly a mile away the track started a stiff grade, where a freight train would have to labor slowly so slowly that a man, agile of foot and sure of hand, could certainly take it with ease. To this point he went, and, selecting a shelter between two bushes that would shelter him from the too active eye of some brakey, as the train approached, he sat down to wait. The moon rose during his vigil, before he heard a far-off humming on the tracks, and then made out a train stopping at the town and starting again. That it was a freight train he had not the slightest doubt, as soon as he heard the redoubled labor of the engine as it reached the grade. Montaigne rose, stretched himself, and, finding all his muscles playing smoothly in spite of the long period of inactivity, crouched again between the bushes and watched the train roar nearer. The sound grew louder. The humming of the rails was now a heavy vibration. The rush of the exhaust was like the deafening noise of a great waterfall. With his brain reeling from the uproar, the blow fell that had been so long avoided. There was a sharp command from behind, and he wheeled to look into the muzzles of three revolvers held by grim-faced men. It is said that remembered dreams are those which occur during the very act of waking. The mind, unencumbered by the slow processes of the senses that burden it during waking moments, plunges through enough events to fill a lifetime, all crammed into a second or two of actual time. So it was with Jack Montaigne, yeah. as he faced the leveled guns and calculated the chances. There was not a line on a single face that he overlooked. Had there been a single symptom of weakness in a single face he would have taken the suicidal chance rather than submit. But there was no weakness. Every eye told him the same story, a readiness to kill on the slightest provocation on his part. So he pushed his hands above his head. To those who held him up it seemed that the gesture of surrender was made instantly. Suffering cows, exclaimed Jack Montaigne to the sheriff, recognizing his antagonist whom he had met during the rainstorm. Is it possible that you've trailed me here? 
trailed, asked the sheriff gently. Not a bit. I just did a little guessing that you'd come over the mountains in this direction, and, if you did, you'd be sure to head for this town, and, if you headed for this town, you'd be sure to strike for this grade to nab a freight. All simple as daylight. Go through him, Judd. The last was addressed to his son, who now adroitly went through the pockets of Jack. The revolver, the pocket knife, tobacco, and brown papers, and a square of sulfur matches was the total of the effects of Jack Montaigne. He's cashed the money, somewheres, said Judd. Ain't any sign of it. Sure he's cashed it, said the sheriff. Any fool would do that, considering how much there is of it. Where'd you put it, Jack? He added casually, of course, anything you say to us may be used against you. I know, said Montaigne, so I won't say anything about the money. And he smiled at the sheriff with what might have been resignation or mockery. Larrabee considered that smile with the most intimate attention. Bring down your hands, he said, but bring em down behind you, then keep moving slow. Afraid I got another gun tucked up my sleeve, asked Montaigne. I'm afraid of you every minute, replied the sheriff with astounding frankness. I might as well tell you, so's you'll know that I'm on the watch for you, every minute. Come to think of it, we'll handcuff your hands in front of you. Here you go. As Montaigne obediently offered his wrists, the monocles were snapped over them. A nice, new pair, observed Montaigne calmly, looking down at them. His quiet manner shocked the younger men of the posse, but the sheriff seemed more and more interested in his victim. What did you do with my hoss? he asked. I suppose you knew we'd sent descriptions of the hoss all over, together with descriptions of you. Did you drill her through the head and let her tumble down a ravine, someplace? I let the hoss run loose, said Montaigne just above town, yonder. I take that kind of you, said the sheriff gently. I take that mighty kind. All right, boys, jump on your hosses, and we'll start. Climb on this one, Jack. Montaigne hesitated. You going to walk, sheriff? I can do it better than you. Ain't handy to walk when you can't swing your hands. It was strange to hear these politely diplomatic moves between the two. Presently Montaigne was seated on the horse, and they started back for the town, with the sheriff walking a little behind the captive. Suddenly he drew up beside his prisoner. Jack, he said, in a purely conversational tone, why did you do it? Do what? asked Montaigne out of a dream. The old boy, old Benton? Why did you finish him? You're a pretty good guesser, answered Montaigne without emotion. Suppose you try to figure this puzzle out. So the matter was allowed to rest. They took a midnight train out, and in the dawn they arrived at the sheriff's county seat, where Montaigne was escorted to the jail. He preserved his careless demeanor throughout, even when the front door of the jail slammed heavily behind him. When they reached the door of the cell designated for Jack, the sheriff drew forth his bunch of keys. Just hold on to your patience for a while, he said to Jack. Take me a while to find the right key. You don't need one answered Montaigne. Here you are. And, folding his hands small, he slipped them deftly out of the handcuffs. 
The sheriff watched with intense interest. You could have done that any time and made a play to get loose, he observed. Why didn't you, Jack? I know you got plenty of nerve for a break. Because I've made my play and finished it. I'm beat, Sheriff, and that's all there is to it. Then he walked calmly into the barred enclosure.